This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome and aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Schwab, and I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. A new term of art has entered into our vocabulary. The new word is big data. Today, our Law Across the Sea program is titled Big Data Has Arrived. And my guest is Hawaii attorney Glenn Melchinger. Glenn is a director at the law firm of Alston Hunt, Floyd and Ng, and his practice often involves issues related to computer systems, cyber technology, and big data. I've asked Glenn to talk to us today about big data, to define it, to tell us where it's from, where it's going, and address some of the issues that have developed around this new world and new word. So Glenn, first, welcome. Good to see you here today. Uh, thank you for being my guest. No, thank you very much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Glenn, what is big data? I mean, where is it from? Where is it going? Give me a, right. a, a, a you know, and you're going to have to dumb this down a little bit for me <laughs> too, okay? Because I, I need to understand it. Right. Well, no, I think I think you, you're plenty plenty savvy yourself, um, but. Big data is a term that's used in many different ways, uh, and it's it's rather vague and abstract, but to try and simplify it a little bit. Um, essentially, we're talking about huge amounts of data that have been gathered. It's, it's said, or I've read this statistic, that in the past couple of years, we've accumulated more data than in the prior, say, 3,000 years of human existence. Um, I also heard that statistic when we were back in 2010 and 2012, so maybe now we have even, even more. more. It's, yeah. it's exponentially increasing. Um, there's a lot of different types of data. And, um, and this is like on the computers and on the internet, or I mean, what, is that, is that where, where we're talking? Right, right. And so, you know, what are we comparing it to? We're comparing it to maybe, you know, people who are doing cave drawings or, <laughs> or writing down the movement of stars or, you know, Archimedes getting out of his bathtub and writing the water displacement or whatever, um, or monks handwriting Bibles, and from all of that time, you know, coming forward, we end up with a lot of data. But now we're talking about um, computers that create data by themselves. Mm. It, a, uh, you know, one example might be, uh, if you look at, at Google, uh, Google is an attempt to, of course, manage and, and enable everybody to search through uh, a ton of data, which is the internet the World Wide Web. Um, and the way they've achieved doing that is by creating even more data about that data and indexing it. So there's layers and layers and layers. And it's all different types. Uh, you end up with video data. Uh, you end up with increasingly, say, AI-generated information about that data. Artificial that, intelligence. Arti AI, correct, yeah. correct. Artificial intelligence. Um, algorithms that will go and look at an image and identify, okay, that's a cat, hmm. uh, and label the photos. Um, there are competitions for this. Um, and you get, of course, user-generated data is one that we're probably the most familiar with. Every time you walk down the street with your smartphone, there's probably GPS tracking you. That's data. There's, you might be posting something to Facebook, more data. You might be emailing, texting, all sorts of different hmm. things. You might pay for something with uh, some payment software on your phone, uh, and you end up with a ton of data that we're all generating every year. And so many of us, I mean, if you watch people walking down the street, they're not supposed to do it as they cross the street, but they're, yeah. they're all on their, their hand set of, of some sort. Right. Yeah. Right, um, and I think it, it is now against the law to look at your phone as you're crossing the street. I don't know whether that works for paper or not, but um, correct, correct. There's a ton of data being generated all over the place, okay. and corporate data. You know, comp you know, companies. Every time you go on Amazon, the flip side of that is they're tracking what you're looking at. They're tracking hmm. what you're interested in. Uh, you go to your Netflix queue, and it has suggestions for you. That's based on an algorithm that looks at what you've looked at in past, 
and ranks things and tries to predict um, what you might be interested in next. So we, uh, as, as humans, begat data. And data begats more data, is what I'm, I'm hearing you say. I think, I think that's right. Uh, there's more and more data about data also being generated. <laughs> and there's a huge and potentially lucrative area of study of data analytics, which you know, people are going into and trying to figure out what that data can be used for. Okay, so, so, so. The, so, the, so the big data, that, that term, right. it, we're talking about all of this now, because I've, I've, I've heard it more and more, okay, right. more and more frequently, big, big data or big data, I've heard that being used, and, uh, and, and I, I'm not sure what it's being used, you know, what, what the ultimate meaning of it is. I mean, right. is, it, is it scary? Should we be happy with it? Is it, is it something, I mean, what, what are the uses of it uh, in, in our lives? And, you know, I mean, my, my thought is that uh, essentially, just to go back and define it a little bit more, what, what is big data? Um, it's something that is perhaps inscrutable. Uh, you, it's hard to absorb how much is there or exactly what's in it. Um, and I, I came into this from the context of, of litigation and uh, searching through documents, trying to find specific things. And I learned there's a... Uh, competition called the TREK competition, the text retrieval conference. And all the e-discovery software vendors get together and try to assault a big piece of you know, maybe over a million emails. Uh, and they try and find particular things in it. Um, and I, my understanding is that, that there's some corpuses of data that were being used for that. And it took some years of them being used before people realized, well, you know, there's personally identifiable information in there. There's social security numbers, there's credit card numbers, there's other things. And in particular, I'm talking about an, an Enron data set of actual emails. Mm -hmm. And it took a while before that maybe got cleaned out pretty well. Um, so it's data that's so big that you, you might have it sitting right in front of you, more or less, but you really can't uh, pierce it. Uh, and you don't know what's in it, perhaps. But my understanding is that there are attempts or there, it is being pierced now in many different areas, uh, commerce and litigation, and, uh, personal use, and what, what's that about? I mean, what, what's happening in, in that respect? Uh, and and there, there are a lot of people who, uh, and I think the key word perhaps that we used before is the word predict. Uh, there are a lot of people who want to look at what data there is and try and see where things are going to go. Netflix wants to know, for example, what are you going to look at? Um, they want to make suggestions because the more they suggest things that you want to see, the better, the more often you're going to go back. Because you may not know from a small interface on your phone or your tablet what they have available. So it depends on their algorithm to serve up these things. An algorithm is just sort of a, um, that's how people are attacking big data. Again, in the litigation context, it's predictive coding or technology-assisted review. It's ways of taking uh, sort of brute force computing power and going against all the text and finding what word is related to another word, how often they come up, and what types of documents, and delivering that to you rather than trying to read through a million emails from start to finish. Well, so, so in, in the commercial use of it, are, are, is big data the total universe of data, or is it somehow broken down into smaller parts, or, or how does the algorithm work in that, in that respect? And then I, I want to talk about the litigation aspect of right. it, too, but, but for, first the commercial. Sure, sure. So and the tools that people are using to, to go against big data, so there, there's several different issues in the question. So you know, one is perhaps the algorithms and the tools that people are using Second is, what is the data? Um, what are people using? What are using is you know, the raw source that they're going to analyze with their algorithm or whatever software they develop. Um, and then you also asked back there, you know, what's sort of the promise of where does all of this go and why bother and who cares, right? Um, so first off, to talk about the, the algorithms, um, people are increasingly getting better at at attacking 
what's in a big data set uh, because of the advent of EI and the neural net computers that can actually learn what you're looking for. And a lot of people, you know, I sat, I sat and watched some, you know, some MIT classes on autonomous vehicles and neural nets and so on. And um, it's interesting to hear the professors admit they don't really know why it's, why it's learning what it's learning. Uh, but some of, you know, some of the tools have really improved dramatically in the past year even. Even just a couple months ago, there was a significant achievement. Um, chess, we have 1997 Deep Blue Beats, Gary Kasparov. It took 20 years before anyone could tackle the problem of Go, however. Um, and so DeepMind, Google purchased a, US, a UK company, and, and they created a program called AlphaGo. And, 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 that, and then Go is the Japanese uh, version of uh, right. chess, if you will. Or right, and, and it's, it's, however, it's also a lot more complex. I mean, chess, you have 64 squares. You got, you know, eight pawns. You got a limited number of pieces. Uh, the full-size Go board is 19 by 19. What I've heard is that you know the different branches and possibilities mathematically are that of the possible Go games mm -hmm. are greater and larger than the number of atoms in the universe or something wow. like that. It's it's not. I mean, maybe you're familiar with Moore's law, which is that computing power or the amount of of uh, transistors you can scribe on a silicon wafer doubles every two years mm -hmm. or something like that. Apparently, we're coming to the end of that, according to Intel. <laughs> by 2020 or so. But then we have quantum computing to go to, so you know, maybe we'll be OK. Uh, but the computing power cannot possibly cover all the possible outcomes if it's the number of atoms in the universe. And it cannot then say, OK, this is the best move for you to do right now and go. So some different level of intelligence had to be developed in the system. So it's, a, it's an incredible achievement. You know, they, in October 2015, the AlphaGo program beat the first professional player. Oh, wow. And then by, I think it was about May of this year, it beat the highest rank, you know, the world champion. Hmm. Um, and it was given a, a ninth Don rating. Uh, <laughs> and then it sort of retired, you know. But the, even, there's a film on this. But even more interesting, perhaps, is how did it get so strong? Yeah. You know, how did it become better than humans at what only humans have been able to do? And from what you now? tell me, I mean, it, it's like you need to have some <clears throat> ability to discern where you're going, right. in a way. Right. It's not just math. Exactly. Exactly. There's, and, and that's why it's been such a wake-up call, and it was the holy grail it, it's, uh, of AI, it, it, as I understand it. It's because it requires some sort of higher order level of strategy involved, perhaps. So in, in this case, um, you end up with it finally achieving that victory. And the training it apparently did was to play itself. The researchers had the program go back and forth and play itself. And you know, it was trained on amateur games. And you know, so it's, it's becoming, you know, are we getting into you know, the computers will become self-aware? And I, I don't know, you know. But it's not generalizable at this point, it seems. But there are increasingly sort of more general um, programs that can, that can learn different games. Um, one of them was uh, one that starts to play Pong. And you, everyone remembers perhaps this game. Well, not everyone. The, young, the youth probably do. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah, it's one of the yeah. first video games I played. You know, when the little thing goes back and forth right. on the screen, the computer could figure that out. Um, when it gets to more complex games, then it becomes a little more difficult. OK, now, we, we have this vast amount of da data out there. What are, the, what are the commercial companies trying to dig from that? And then I, wa I want to hear your response to that. And then I want to take, take a little bit of a break. And then I want to come back and hear about the law, where, where we're going on the law. Sure. Um, so companies, I think, are they're looking for any kind. Of, they're, they're looking through their data to try and figure out where there is some kind of actionable intelligence. Um, it would make sense to talk a little bit about sort of what the promise of big data is. Uh, and big data sets have been used, for example, to help reallocate resources in a, in a very 
uh, efficient way. Um, there's somebody who's done uh, to prevent too many women in India from having to use cooking fires, which damage their lungs. Uh, they have created a system and, and managed and wrangled a bunch of different data sets together to figure out where do we put um, clean fuel stores that are close to every single village in India. How do we allocate that and put them on the map? And there are people who've solved these problems using data sets and using algorithms. So that's kind of the promise. The companies, they're looking at it to find how do we find the next big thing? How do we find the next product that's going to hit? How do we you know, become Apple or something like that? How, how do we make money? How do we but make I, money? I am uh, pleased to hear that there sounds to be some good that comes out of this. And I want to talk about that after the break. So okay. Thank you. Sure. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way. There's got to be solution. How to make a brighter day. everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome back. I'm Mark Shklov, host of Law Across the Sea on Think Tech Hawaii, and I am with Glenn Melchinger, and we are talking about big data or big data, and however you want to pronounce it, I, I suppose, but the, the question is, what does it do? Where is it from? Where is it going? Uh, what is it being used for? And I was glad, Glenn, when we left off, I was a little bit worried about big data and how it's being used because, uh, I mean, we, we were talking about uh, the ability now that it can, it can uh, play a game of goal and win, but that requires a little, I mean, does that, does that require intelligence? I'm not sure. But, but then you also talked about some uh, uh, ways that it's being used to help people, uh, to tell where we can use uh, uh, gas, I guess, in India for to cut down on, on harmful effects, and that, and that I guess that you delve into that data and and find out what makes sense uh, in in uh, the location of stores and that type of thing, and also, but generally speaking, uh, you know, my impression was big, big data was being used by by commerce to make money mm -hmm. to figure out you know what the best way to go. Mm -hmm. How how do we use it in law? How how is it being? Tell us a little bit more about that. And is it? I mean. And I, I want to. I also. I want to talk at some point about uh, the pros and cons. The, more. I, I mm -hmm. want to talk about if we're losing something by using big data or going into it. But right. to, let's talk about the law. Where, right. where, where are we with the law? What, what are the goods and bads, if you will? Or is it, or is there a bad or, or good? Well, you know, it's it's hard to perhaps put a, a judgment on. Just the data, yeah. uh, it's good, good or bad, it's out there. Um, on the other hand, uh, it is becoming something that a select few very large companies have lots of, um, and it is essentially becoming an asset for them uh, to the extent that they can actually create some value out of it. Um, there are, you know, I've heard a statistic recently that a lot of attempts to do data an analytics on big data and create something or monetize it in some way have not necessarily come into fruition. Um, it may be that you know somebody goes through a whole process in a company and then they find out, well, you know, my employees, they really aren't making better decisions about anything. Um, and so how that, how it plays out, is it good or bad? Um, that's a little hard to say. 
That's perhaps. a judgment call. I right? think I yeah. think it's a judgment call. You know, I mean, if if we sort of step back, sort of scientifically, the data is is data. It's information that's out there. Um, there are people, however, are pointing to the a bad potential use of it, or perhaps you should say a harmful use. Um, there's a, uh, a a bestseller out called Weapons of Math, M A T H Destruction. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, Kathy O'Neill uh, wrote this and became a New York Times bestseller last year. Um, and she talks a lot about how the algorithms specifically can be discriminatory. Um, well, you know, and why is that? Well, if you're looking to predict the future from a past data set in which you've only collected for certain types of things, um, and it's limited in certain ways, and for that matter, the data only encompasses what is actually measurable in some way. You know, you can't run a lot of analytics on things that you can't quantify. Um, and, and that's what she, that's the field she comes from. She's, she was a quant in a, someone who's doing math in a Wall Street firm. Uh, then, you know, you have to begin to look at algorithms perhaps as um, something like an argument or an opinion. That's her take. Um, and well, if you're, well, she, 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 she's saying math destruction. Weapons of math <laughs> destruction, right. And so she points in particular in her book to a couple of particular examples. So uh, pre-2008, all the trading algorithms and other things and the, type, the, the inability to perceive risk in, of subprime mortgages and collateralized debt obligations and that kind of thing led to collapses, led to a lot of people losing their jobs. Um, and you know, what, what, is, what do we learn from that is her question. Um, and I'm not you know, taking position on her book either way, but uh, I think the question ends up being, what do, you, what do you do with the data? What do we decide to do with the data? Is there some uh, overarching uh, morality that we're going to impose on how to use it, for example? So, and it comes, it comes down to humans, then, is what I, I hear you saying. Even though we're dealing with data and machines and computers and technology, humans are still involved in this, and it's, right. it, it's still coming back to the good and the bad of people. Right. You know, and we, we're living in an age which is incredible because we're, we're bordering on whether we really get to the stage where we're living in the Terminator movies or something like that, you know, or whether HAL is going to become sentient and, and kick us out of the spaceship or whatever it is. Um, and there are people who are warning about this, you know. Um, uh, Masayoshi Song is, you know, talking about the singularity when computers exceed human level of understanding. You know, and that's, but that's one of the benefits of big data too. I mean, we have you have microscopes, which allow you to see small stuff. You have electron microscopes, even smaller, particle colliders, all these types of things, telescopes. You, we can see through things with x-rays, et cetera. Big data, you know, there's one example that I came across. Um, somebody who was watching his kid learn language. He, he, he did something that all parents should do, I'm sure, put nine cameras in all of his rooms and <laughs> recorded everything that everybody was saying. You know, God forbid we live in that. Um, but he made fascinating discoveries about how his son's vocabulary increased, and when a new word would become learned. And it wasn't necessarily how many times the, his boy saw it. It was maybe different contexts. The word comes up in different contexts across different ways. And you know, so there's. There's things that big data told him about how we learn language that are beyond our ability, especially when you're sleepless and waking up and doing midnight feedings or whatever the heck it is, that any of us are going to perceive. Um, so that, that may be one of the further promises of big data, which is it, it's extra superhuman level of perception about trends and how things go. But, and one thing, I mean, with respect to the legal aspect, I've heard people are concerned about their privacy. And they're concerned that anybody now or, or right. somebody with the right uh, algorithm right. can go in and find uh, you know, your background and your banking information and go deep into a lot of things about you and 
where, where do, how are we protected? Are we protected or is this a, a new world that we still have to uh, walk into? Well, we, we have to wait and see. Um, I'm blanking on the name of the case, but the, the, I think the Supreme Court has picked up on cert, a, the third party doctrine as it's called, which is if I choose to walk down the street with my phone and I have my GPS turned on, that GPS data, which sits in the hands of a third party uh, ISP or it sits in the hands of a phone service provider, that's not my data anymore. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, it, there are cultures, however, that have very, you know, the EU has a very different conception about what is private, what is personal. Um, they have a very pretty strict regime about bringing data out of Europe into the U.S. or anywhere else. So what, what happens? I mean, what's the result of that? Well, the result of that is, in the U.S., you, once you put it out there, more or less, generally speaking, you kind of lose control to some extent, um, especially if someone is criminally intent on getting your information. Um, hackers, et cetera, if it's out there, they're going to get it. So there, there might so, be more protection in Europe than in the United States. Is what I, there may be. I there may be. Uh, right now. But, right. I mean, in, in, at least in Europe, having control over your information is deemed a fundamental right. And in some other countries, you know, if you look at China, which just had passed a new cybersecurity law, in broad strokes, it creates the ability for you know the Alibabas and the Baidus to become the computational force to help the government find people they want to find. Hmm. Um, and even Apple and other people, other companies that have tried to get into that market, have had to bow to that. So I mean, you may or may not remember. Uh, there was an Apple versus FBI fight some oh, time yeah. ago right. uh, about whether anyone could create a backdoor into through the cryptography in the iPhone. Uh, Apple fought that. Ironically, that was solved by uh, somebody coming in saying, "We'll break it. Don't worry." And, and you know, my understanding is that you know, for about a seven figures, they just broke into the iOS uh, and got the data. Um, so, you know, on the other hand. Yeah, so privacy, wither privacy, I, you know, I, it, that's a big, a big question. It's a big thing yeah. for the future and for law and practice. Right. And, and I'd like you to, as we close out here, I'd like you to tell me a little bit about where you see this going. I, 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 I feel uh, a little bit of hope because, uh, well, both hope and sometimes despair, I guess, but uh, because human beings are involved and some of this requires the judgment of human beings Although machines seem to be adopting some of that um, in some ways, I don't know if they can become humanity. Uh, perhaps mm. not. Perhaps that's too much to expect. I, I think it is. But uh, where are we going with this? Uh, what are your concluding thoughts on on big, big, big data? Well, I, I mean, I hope it becomes it, it, the dialogue heads it into it's being a tool um, and uh, for good. But for for some <laughs> constructive social purpose, right, and and using it with other tools, um, you know, there's there's another uh, bit of, well, uh, it gets into another further discussion, and I'm sure how much time we have left, but um, there are ways of people thinking about using what they are calling thick data, which is oh my gosh, data the unmeasurables, the things that you can't quantify. And also combining those two things together to make decisions. Uh, because you know, at the end of the day, I hope people begin to realize that if you have a set data set that may or may not be biased, it's, it's not going to help you predict what's really coming down the pike. because The future is unknowable. Um, so perhaps you know, the question ultimately becomes uh, one that Lewis Carroll, a mathematician in his own right, asked through Humpty Dumpty in the looking glass several years ago, you know, Alice is querying saying, can you really use words? And, and you say data, I say data, whatever. Can you really use words to mean so many things? And he says basically that, you know, the question is who is to be master? That's all. And that seems to be the fundamental question of our time. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think we have a, a closing photo of Humpty Dumpty for us uh, and Alice. And so perhaps we have to look back in time for some answers and what it all means. Glenn, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mark.
Aloha. Aloha.